Let's prepare for worship. Please stand if you're able. Hear the promises of the Lord our God. Hear the calling of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us worship God with our hymn number 726, Will You Come and Follow Me? are the people of God in this place, let us therefore unite our hearts in the prayer for this Lord's day. Let us pray. God, your Son Jesus Christ bore the cross for our salvation and was raised from the dead for the redemption of the world. Give us the courage to take up our cross and follow him, that through his grace we may accept the cost of faithful discipleship 
and receive the joy of everlasting life with Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. And in my announcements, I fail to remind you that on Wednesday evenings, we enjoy wonderful soup and bread and the sharing of God's Word. Thank you, deacons, for that ministry. We meet in the lounge at 6 o'clock. It is my pleasure to receive into membership today new members with Daryl and Sherry. And Declan, come on up and join me up here. Declan. I said Declan, didn't I? Goodness. Ah, the aging thing. <laughs> and good morning to you. Good morning. This is just fine. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And everyone who acknowledges me before people, I will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. My friends, Jesus Christ has chosen you and in baptism has joined you to himself. He's called you together with us into the church which is his body. And now he's brought you to this time and place so that you may confess his name and go out and serve him as faithful disciples. Who is your Lord and Savior? Do you trust in him? If so, say, I do. Do you intend to be his disciple, to obey his word, and to show his love? If so, say, I do. Will you be a faithful member of this congregation, giving of yourself in every way? And will you seek the fellowship of the church wherever you may be? If so, say, I will. I will. Well, Daryl and Sherry and Declan, you are received into this church with joy as brothers and sisters in Christ. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty go with you as you faithfully serve the Lord whom you love. Welcome to this ministry. Welcome. Welcome. You may be seated. It's so much fun to welcome new folks into the life of the church, isn't it? And to realize just how broad God's reach is throughout the world. God has brought each of us to this time and place we are a family in this place. And so trusting in the mercy of the Lord which is forever, let us unite our hearts in the prayer of confession for this Lord's day. O oh God, the writer of Proverbs advises us to trust in you with all our heart and not to lean on our own understanding. But we have lost the conviction and pioneering spirit of our fathers and mothers before us. We give up and take the safe paved path rather than blaze new trails of faith by trusting in your covenant promises of steadfast love that endures forever. Give us confidence in you, filled with courage and the resiliency of heart, mind, and will, we pray. Amen. Let us take a time of silent prayer. My friends, the Scripture says that God puts His Spirit upon us and in our hearts and makes all things new. Hear and believe the good news of the Gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are always forgiven. Let us stand and march forth by the power of the Holy Spirit, giving God the glory. Please stand.
be with you. Good to see you. Peace, Jack. Peace, Glenn. Good morning. Good morning, O1. I miss you. How you doing? How was your seminar? Um, it was pretty good. Long, huh? <laughs> good morning. Peace. Peace be with you. Peace. And to you. Hey, sick guy. How you feeling? How you feeling? How you feeling? You, gosh, you're wasting away to nothing. Yeah, I'll be praying for you. Peace be with you. Well, children, come join me for the children's sermon. All y'all, come on up. Good morning. Have a Pez. Have another. What? Let's see. There we go. This is not cooperating sometimes. I don't understand this. It requires an engineering degree, I think. There we go. What are you doing down there? I can't reach. Come, you don't want one. Lad, schedule an appointment with me. Good morning. Good morning. All the way down. Well, today I have a question for you. What a surprise. Rev and his questions. Huh? Well, here's my question. Do you ever go to the doctors? Yeah. Do you? Do you? Yeah, yeah you go to the doctors. You ever get a thing called an inoculation? An inoculation? An inoculation? What is that? It's a shot in the arm. You had a shot in the arm? Yeah. Have you? And we used to call it shots when I was a kid. Now they call it inoculations. Sounds better, doesn't it? No. You, I have a question then about that. When you go to the doctor for an inoculation, do you say, Hooray, I'm getting an inoculation! You do? Schedule that appointment quickly. <laughs> you don't say hooray? You hate shots? So did I. When I was a kid, my doctor, whenever I had to have an inoculation, he would fool me. He would say, you know, Edmund, that's my first name, Edmund, we have a mouse in the office. Really? It's right over there. Look over there. I bet that mouse is going to come out any moment. Zap! <laughs> what would not make your flu shot not hurt? He punched you in the arm and then gave you the flu shot. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> well, why don't you like shots? They're annoying and they hurt. Does it hurt to get a shot? Yeah, sort of, right? Well, then why in the world would you do something that causes you to hurt? Why would you get something that causes you to hurt? It can save your life. Make you tougher, okay. But it can save your life. And so we endure some present pain for the great benefit of saving your life. Very profound. Have you ever had to take medicine? You have? Does it always taste wonderful and good? No. Does it taste yucky? How about you? Never tastes good, does it? They might try to put some cherry stuff in it or something. 
Never works. I don't care. So do you ever say, Oh, I'm going to take some medicine today. Woohoo! No? No? So, so why do you take something that tastes yucky? Because it can save your life. Or your parents make you. Okay. <laughs> Truth. The point I'm trying to make is that we have learned that sometimes suffering or something that doesn't feel good or doesn't taste good or that's uncomfortable has the effect of saving our life. How did Jesus die? He hung on a cross. What was it like, do you think, to hang on a cross? Not pleasant. Unpleasant. They, they drove nails through his hands and his feet to hold him onto the cross. And they hung him there to basically suffocate and die and bleed out. And it hurt terribly, terribly, terrible. A very horrible death. Why would Jesus allow that to happen, do you think? Yeah. He was sacrificing His life for us. He took away the sins of the world. He died, the Scripture says, so that we might live just like the inoculation helps us to survive and thrive. Just like the medicine which doesn't taste good, makes us healthy and well. Jesus dies so that we can live forever with Him. So Jesus died. Did He stay dead? No. But God brought Him back to life on the third day. And we know that the pain and agony and suffering and the yuckiness of what he went through, it succeeded. It worked. And he has accomplished his mission. So, do we need to be afraid of dying? Well, honestly, in our humanity, sure, we don't look forward to that. But will we who are in Christ stay dead? No, we will live with Jesus eternally because He died for us. We've had a very large children's sermon today. A very complicated thing, but I think if you think about sometimes suffering and how it produces important and good results, we can understand that Jesus in His love suffered for us so that we might live in Him forever. Well, thank you for being good theologians. Let's have a prayer. Help us to understand the challenging and complex things that seem so grown up and, and complicated, Lord. Help us to remember that inoculations help us stay healthy. Help us to remember that medicine, even if it tastes yucky, brings about good results, help us to most of all understand that Jesus in His love died suffering for us and shows us what love looks like and shows us what eternal life is going to be in Him. He is the conqueror. He is our King. And we pray in His name. Amen. I didn't hear a loud amen. I need a loud amen. 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 I got some from over there too. Amen. Well, God bless you. Off to Sunday school, and let's stand for the hymn. That's right.
seated. Let us pray. Give us your light. Show us your path. Guide our feet that we may follow you, Lord Jesus Christ. Bless us in the reading and proclamation of the word, we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, the Old Testament reading for today is from Genesis chapter 17, uh, verses 1 through 7, and then verses 15 and 16, uh, which you can find on page 13 of the Pew Bible. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. It's a big page turn. The, uh, <laughs> the epistle reading this morning uh, is from Romans chapter 4, verses 13 through 25. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, <clears throat> who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses, and was raised for our justification. Here also the gospel for this Lord's day, turning to the gospel according to St. Mark, reading verses 31 through 38. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wants to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. 
and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Here ends the Gospel for this Lord's Day. May God bless the reading and proclamation of his word. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God, our Heavenly Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The apt question of the day, who is this King? Who is this King, Jesus Christ? I was speaking with one of my much younger colleagues, and we were chatting about this passage, and I asked him how he was going to present it today in his church. Well, he said, I'm going to talk about reality TV. I'm going to talk about reality shows. Immediately I recognized that there was a difference of generation between us. He said, a lot of people today really get absorbed in watching these reality shows. And here in this Gospel passage, we see an expose of the real Jesus. Jesus Christ, the reality show, right here in the Gospel of Mark. There's no fluff, no muffin around, no this and that. 
You see where the rubber meets the road in this passage. My word, I thought. He gets there. He takes a tour through reality shows, but he gets there, doesn't he? For in this eighth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, we see a sudden, decisive moment, a turn in the story of that reality show called Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Jesus has previously, in a vignette before this, healed a man who was blind so that he could see. And then after having healed the man of his physical ailment, so that the man can see, he now turns to his disciples and the crowd which is always mingling around him, so that while they physically are able to see, he is about to enable them to spiritually see something very important. They will see him turn towards the cross. They will see him disclose openly his understanding and intention of the immediacy of the cross. He realizes that his time is at hand and it is short, and he wants them to finally spiritually see that he will suffer and die. In the passage immediately preceding that which I read, he says, who do people say that I am? Peter says, you are the Christ. Good job, Peter. A+. Plus. You get the gold star for your confession of faith. But what do you mean by that, Peter? Who is the King? Who is this King? Who is this Messiah? The common understanding. Remember, I taught you that word that I've already forgotten that says that people have a tendency towards common understanding and everyone believes something to be true. Even if it's not true, they believe it to be true. The common understanding when Peter confesses his faith in Christ is that Jesus is the Son of Man. He is the Messiah. And what was understood by that from some of the Old Testament prophets and particularly an apocalyptic and uh, apocryphal work called the book of Enoch, was that, that the Son of Man would come, this, this Messiah would come, and this Messiah would come in power and schwack everybody that was an evildoer. Also known as the Romans. That this, this powerful figure would come and, and deal with all the evildoers and put down the evildoers, lift up righteousness, and reestablish Israel. You are the Son of Man. You are the Son of God. You are the Messiah. That's what they understood. And in the face of that understanding, Jesus discloses and shows them that He is the suffering servant of God and that He must endure His passion. He must undergo even death to take away the sin of the world. Peter is upset by this presentation. The Gospel of Mark is not kind to Peter as it reports this in this, this uh, reality TV episode. Peter pulls Jesus aside and says, Jesus, I'm here to correct your theology. It's a good thing I'm around. To help you out. You're just not quite getting it. You misunderstand Enoch and what everybody understands. And Jesus in front of the disciples and all gathered around says, Get behind me, Satan. Jesus confronts disciples who want to have an easygoing faith. Jesus confronts those who just simply want to go from His incarnation and birth to the radical kingdom of heaven where Everything is fixed right. And all the evildoers are put down and the reign of God is assured. It's like having an Oreo cookie, but not wanting the double stuffing. All you get is two cookies, not an Oreo cookie. The stuffing in the middle is how do we get 
to the victory of the kingdom of God. How do we get to Jesus who is Christus Victor? And the answer that Jesus tells them is that He must suffer and He must die. He must undergo His passion for the sin of the world. Jesus lays it out for them and He lays it out for us telling us what the cost is. What the cost is to the Christ. And then inviting us to come and follow Him. He lays out what the cost of Christ is and then invites us as those who follow Him and are His disciples to take up our cross and follow Him indeed. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name, we sang. Will you take up your cross and suffer for the Christ? Jesus depicts the generations of humankind as adulterous and sinful. Has anything changed throughout the generations since Jesus? In our fallenness as a humanity, are not our generations adulterous regarding the covenant of God? Are not our generations sinful regarding the law and the will of God? Do not we, as we are confronted by this text, do not we want to run and hide from the suffering that is expected of us? Do we not want to skip from the Palm Sunday parade and not observe any worship during that holy week and simply run to the Easter celebration of the resurrection of our Lord? Do we want to have a Wednesday night consideration of the passion of Christ? Do we want to have a Thursday night that is well attended as we remember the institution of Holy Communion? Do we want to gather for Tenebrae on a Good Friday, and remember the suffering of the Lord? Do we want to stand on Holy Saturday and and wait in eager anticipation of the redemption of our souls in the resurrection of Christ? Or do we want to skip from the Palm Sunday parade to Easter? Surely it is not a natural thing to want to gladly embrace suffering. But the self that Jesus invites us to be is not the self of the adulterous and sinful generation. The self that Jesus invites us to be is to recapture that self that God placed in us in creation when God breathed into us the breath of life. That's the self in harmony and in covenant and in love with God that we are invited to but we live in a generation where after the Super Bowl, the hero of the game is interviewed and they say to him, so what are you going to do now that you won the Super Bowl? And the answer is, we live in a Disney World world where everything is a magic kingdom and we're supposed to have a smurfy, beautiful, happy, happy day. Jesus says, if you wish to follow me, take up your cross. If you wish to follow me, return to your genuine self. If you wish to follow me, your following will be about suffering, but it will also be about joy. If you wish to follow me, Follow me to the cross. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the magnificent theologian of the 20th century. Dietrich Bonhoeffer reflecting on this text, obviously before the time when he was incarcerated and hung by the Nazis. He commented on this text and he says, when Jesus invites you to follow Him, He bids you come and die. In a world 
that is focused on Palm Sunday parades in a world that wants to go to Disneyland or Disney World, in a world that wants to skip over the challenges and the the stuff of moral fiber in life, in a world where there are desperately poor and hurting people needing the salvation that God has enabled us to bring, in a world of broken relationships where God has entrusted us with God's love and reconciling justice and concern, in a world that is desperately in need and out of sorts. Jesus says, don't run away from the pain. Run towards it with the sacrificial love of Christ. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Amen. Our hymn is number 819. Let us confess our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us bring our good gifts to the great God.
God, give us a passion for the cross, not only receiving, but in following Jesus, lifting up and claiming our own. Make us keenly aware of our ministry. Enable us to see where you would have us serve, where it might even cost us something of our lives. Today we offer prayers of intercession asking that you would comfort your people remembering especially Jean Warner on the death of her husband, Norm, and Tom Clark on the death of his wife. We pray for your healing touch for Phil and Walt and Wendy and John and Linda and Booter. Be with homebound Betty. Be with Maria as she journeys through the valley of the shadow. Be with Anita and Todd and Arlene, Reverend Lois Randolph and Laura, Sherry, the Rinker family, Tim Bond and family. Be with David as he struggles for health at the University of Pennsylvania Hospital. Bless Rebecca and Rich and Michael and Paul and Van surround Carolyn with your healing care. Loving God, be with those in this congregation who are facing ill health. Be with those on the campus facing the flu and a variety of viruses. Lord God, lift us up. We pray for relief from the hard weather that we face. We pray for safety in our travels. We pray this day for our presbytery as it's consumed with complications and turmoil and our synod as it's in transition. We pray for our denomination that it may be found faithful in all things. And as always, we pray for your church throughout the entire world. Give it strength. Give it vision. Give it the profound presence of Christ whom we follow. And now be with us as we take to our lips the prayer that the Master taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn is number 320.
And now may grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be upon and abide with you all, each and every one, now and forevermore. Amen.